OCO, I'm Feather Smith, Cherokee Nation cultural biologist. Today I'll be talking about Cherokee ethnobiology. So breaking down the word ethnobiology, ethno refers to the study of people, biology refers to the study of the environment. So we're, we're going to be talking about how Cherokee people interact with their environment and the plants around us. So this says that no self-respecting Cherokee would ever be without a corn patch. This is sort of an old Cherokee proverb or an old Cherokee quote that really drives home just how important not only was the corn for us, but our crops really were for us. Uh, for Cherokees, especially pre-European con uh, contact, you weren't be uh, and you weren't going to be able to go to the grocery store to pick up your groceries. So we grew everything and we were reliant on our environment for everything that we needed to survive. So even today, we consider that no self-respecting Cherokee would ever be without a corn patch because this is really kind of at the heart of who we were as a people. So originally, Cherokee spread across parts of the southeastern United States. Uh, we lived in parts of the North Carolina, South Carolina, Virginia, West Virginia, Alabama, Kentucky, Tennessee, and Georgia in the eastern deciduous forest. When the Trail of Tears occurred, we were moved into what is modern day Oklahoma, and we sort of luck out that we're still on the fringe of that eastern deciduous forest. So a lot of what we were used to environment-wise and plant-wise is sort of similar where we are today, but still we had to get used to an eco shift going from the southeast US to Oklahoma. Uh, but what we've also experienced since being moved into Oklahoma is now a climate shift. So this kind of helps to break that down. An easy way of looking at this slide is to view the maximum temperatures in Oklahoma in July. These are the maximum and minimum temperatures uh, in Oklahoma and in the Eastern homelands during time of removal. And what we see is that the maximum temperature here in Oklahoma was 92.7 degrees Fahrenheit. We really weren't getting any warmer at that point than 93 degrees Fahrenheit. And obviously that's just not true today. Uh, it is not uncommon for us to get above 100 degrees during July. So we've experienced this climate shift since getting here into Oklahoma that really kind of shows our adaptability. The environment's gonna change and what plants are gonna be able to grow here and thrive here and the way that they're gonna grow and thrive here is going to change. So we've always been having to sort of adapt to all of these changes in our environment. So there's sort of two parts to this presentation. First, we'll talk about the Cherokee Nation seed bank activities, and then we'll go over some cultural forestry and really kind of focus on uh, some of those native plants. So how did the Cherokee Nation seed bank get started? Uh, the way that the conversation really got started for the Cherokee Nation seed bank was because of the Cherokee purple tomato. One of our council members uh, wanted to see the purple tomato represented in the Svalbard seed bank since we are a sovereign nation. But what we kind of already suspected at the time and were able to go ahead and confirm is that the Cherokee purple tomato is not what we consider to be a true Cherokee seed and that it's not something that was cultivated by the tribe, especially for a long time and pre-European contact. Um, however, as we were looking into the Cherokee purple tomato, we found all of these seeds that were unique to us as a Cherokee people that really nobody else was growing for the purpose of genetic preservation. And without growing these seeds for the purpose of genetic preservation, they were actually in danger of eventually being lost. And so we, of course, took that responsibility upon ourselves started growing these seeds to make sure that they were never going to be lost, that the genetics would remain pure. And then out of that, we were able to give the excess back to our citizens. This has also helped with language and cultural preservation, which is sort of the reason that most people think this got started. But really, uh, we were just wanted to make sure that these seeds were gonna be protected and that this part of Cherokee culture and history wasn't gonna be lost. So the Cherokee Nation Seed Bank distributes somewhere between about 20 to 30 different varieties of seed every single year. Uh, around half of those varieties are, are heirloom crops and then about the other half actually come from the native plants that we grow in the Cherokee Nation heirloom garden and native plant site. Uh, so of course, one of the things that Cherokees are known for growing are the three sisters, Selu corn, Tuya beans and Wagu or Wagugi uh, squash. We also grew Gulun, which is gourds uh, and that three sisters method, gourds can be grown kind of similarly to the way that we would use squash. 
and then we grow drolla, uh, tobacco, and then we also have a variety of native plants that come into that uh, Cherokee Nation heirloom garden native plant site. And if we can get seeds off of those native plants, we provide that through the seed bank as well. So corn is the first part of that three sisters method. It would be the first thing that would be planted. You want to give this a little bit of size, we'll give it a chance to, to get a little bit of size to it before we would start growing those other two uh, sisters. The corn pictured here is the Cherokee yellow flower corn, the Cherokee colored flower corn, and the Cherokee white flower corn. They're all referred to as flower corns because they're really best ground in the cornmeal. This is not going to be a good roasting corn. It's not something that you're generally going to want to eat directly off the cob, but it makes some of the best cornmeal. Now, of course, corns referred to as maize. The uh, scientific name for that is Zaya maize. But as Cherokees, we often refer to corn as mother corn. And if you think about it, for a lot of the other crops that we grew, you never really hear anything else referred to as like mother beans or mother squash. But we did talk about mother corn. And the reason for that is corn is really one of our most important crops because it's one of the easiest things to grow. Uh, year after year growing out there on site, one of the things that we run into is that every year we run into some type of an issue. Every year we're gonna have some issues with which each of the crops that we're growing, but we can always rely on corn to give us a good harvest. So it's sort of like no matter how your year is going, you know that corn is gonna give a good harvest. We're gonna have food at the end of the year, at the end of the day. Um, and that's why it's so important. It's the easiest thing to grow. Now our Cherokee white eagle corn is probably our oldest and most unique variety of seed. Uh, this is actually known to have been carried across the Trail of Tears. Um, we often hear the stories about people who would take seeds that we had always grown and actually would sew them into pockets within their clothing. But we actually do know that this was one that was brought across the trail. Um, it grows on a red cob. The kernels themselves can be anywhere from about a white yellow color to kind of a purple blue color. The corn, the plants can get up to about eight to 10 feet tall. According to literature, here in Oklahoma, they can actually potentially get up to about 15 feet tall. On a perfect corn cob of Cherokee white eagle corn, every purple or blue kernel that we have will have this Cherokee white eagle flying across the side of it. Uh, so that's one of the things, one of the distinguishing marks of our Cherokee white eagle corn. You can also see at the top of this picture, there's a dent in that corn. It is known as a dent corn. Um, and it's kind of the same way. It's, it's really gonna be best ground and brew to meal or some of these can be made into hominy, uh, but these are not generally gonna be real great as roasting corns. Now we also grow four different varieties of beans. All of our beans are pole beans. So they're gonna want something to grow up. Um, in that three sisters method, beans would be planted next. They would be allowed to grow up the corn, and as they do, they're going to provide some structure to that stock. They also help to fix nitrogen in the soil. Corn really likes a lot of nitrogen, uh, so these two things grow together well for that reason. We have the Cherokee long greasy beans, Cherokee trail of tears beans, uh, black turkey gizzard beans, and brown turkey gizzard beans. They can all be eaten as a green bean or they're also snap beans, so we can wait for them to dry out, snap them open, get that dried bean and prepare any other, uh, any way that you would any other dried bean. Now squash is the third part of that three sisters method. Uh, squash will be planted a couple of feet away from those other two varieties. Um, and the nice thing about squash is that it really branches out and kind of gets in between everything and it sort of shades out the ground. So it tends to help with moisture retention and you're not gonna have to weed underneath that shade too often. So it, it keeps, uh, cuts down a little bit on the weeding in um, the garden. The only squash variety that we currently grow is the Georgia Candy Roaster Squash, which is a sweet winter squash. Um, this is our most popular seed variety. Every single year, it is the first seed variety that we are gonna run out of. Um, so it's, you know, if you're wanting squash, it's definitely important to get your seed order in early with us. Uh, it is a sweet squash. So any recipe calling for squash, sweet potatoes, or pumpkins, the Georgia Candy Roaster can actually be used for that. Individual fruits can get anywhere from about a foot up to potentially two feet uh, long. They can potentially weigh up to about 25 pounds, although probably 10 to 12 pounds is more uh, a normal uh, size. And they can last all winter long. 
Whenever we go to harvest these off of the vine, we want to leave about an inch or two of the stem on that, and they will usually be able to be stored for several months that way. Now gourds can be grown the same way in that Three Sisters method. Uh, the gourds that we grow are not edible. These are going to be great for utilitarian use. Gourds are nice to allow to dry out and then once they turn brown, they kind of turn woody and they can be used as storage vessels, um, especially for storing or carrying water. The gourd that we have pictured here are basket gourds, so they're sort of larger round gourds. We also grow the dipper gourds, which are round at one end with sort of a long handle growth. And then we have jewelry gourds, which are really tiny, only about three inches in total size. They were oftentimes uh, used on necklaces and would be used for carrying medicine. Uh, gourds are sort of funny in that all gourds are considered to be old world. They're not um, native to the Americas. They're sort of native to the Mediterranean region, but they predate European contacts. So nobody's really quite sure how they wound up here in the Americas, possibly came across on that Bering Land Bridge. Um, but we have been growing these for a long time. Now, native tobacco, we do provide uh, tobacco through the Cherokee Nation Seed Bank to those who are 18 or older. Uh, native tobacco is about nine to 10 times stronger than that of smoking tobacco when it comes to nicotine content. This stuff is really too strong to be smoked recreationally. It is used for ceremonial purposes, for medicinal purposes. But even for people who don't plan on using it for ceremonial purposes, it is an attractive plant to grow in the garden. Uh, it gets a nice, pretty yellow flower on it. It's a great attractor of pollinators. Um, you know, you'll get a lot of the pollinators, the insects coming to the tobacco. It will also attract hummingbirds. Um, and then it can also be kind of used as a, a natural pesticide, but tobacco does attract its own pest. For those who do like to grow tomatoes, uh, tomato hornworms are actually tobacco hornworms. So if you're growing tobacco, the hornworms will be attracted to that. Uh, they'll be on your tobacco instead of your tomatoes. And in most cases, they won't actually kill the tobacco because that is the host plant. Uh, the, we also have sunchokes. Sunchokes are a native plant. They're actually a sunflower. Um, they can get up to be about eight feet or taller. But sunchokes are sometimes referred to as wild potato. Um, so true wild potatoes, which are what's pictured in the upper right hand corner of this, are technically a vine. They like to grow somewhere near the water. And they are in the potato family, but they get very, very tiny potatoes on them. Uh, nothing much larger than that of about the diameter of a quarter. So it's really, really hard to find enough of these to get a really great meal. One sunchoke plant can provide up to five gallons of sunchoke tubers. Uh, so they almost really make a better source of a type of wild potato, but they're not true potatoes. As you can see, they actually, they almost kind of look like a ginger root. They're technically a root tuber, uh, but they can be eaten very similarly to a potato. You can uh, slice them up and eat them raw and they kind of have the texture of like a water chestnut. They're sort of uh, kind of a nutty flavor and texture, or you can cook them up just about any way that you would cook a potato. And the more cooked they are, uh, the more they, they taste and have the texture of a, a cooked potato. Uh, now, for anybody who is interested in Cherokee Nation seeds, um, you do, we do require tribal membership. So uh, we will take seed requests for anyone who is a member of the Cherokee Nation, United Katua Band of Cherokees, or the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians. Of course, you have to have an interest in getting your hands dirty. You're going to have to be out there in the garden. It's going to take some work. Um, our contact information is on here. The phone number to call is 918-453-5336. We do have a website, and that is the way that we recommend for most people to order seeds now, is to get on the website. But you can also send an email to seedbank at cherokee.org, and um, we'll send you a link to that website and be able to help with any issues you might have when trying to set up an account and fill out the application for the Cherokee Nation Seed Bank. So this says that you will get snake bit. We're not referring to literal snake bit, but sometimes uh, when working in the garden, you know, things aren't gonna quite work out the way that we want them to. So a great example of that is in our squash. This is what a good healthy squash looks like. Uh, this is what we want our squash to look like. At the bottom it says Osta or good. But a couple years ago, we were having some issues where our uh, squash was not looking quite so good. 
Um, it was literally wilting in front of our eyes within just a matter of hours. You can see in this plant that there is some healthy leaves still on these squash, but all of the vines that you see that have no leaves, they basically died, the leaves have turned to slime. And even though there's edible squash there, the problem is, is that plant dies too soon. That edible squash may not have viable seeds in it. And of course, for our purposes, uh, we need to get viable seeds, but even for um, uh, purposes of growing, if you wanna be able to grow your squash again next year, you're gonna want viable seeds. So that was really kind of an issue for us. And what we discovered was that bacterial wilt was the problem. So cucumber beetles are little tiny green beetles. They somewhat look similar to some people, uh, kind of like a green ladybug. They've got the little spots on them. They're not ladybugs. But whenever they feed on the squash plants, they put a will or a, a bacteria that they carry in their gut into uh, this, the vine of that squash plant and it can cause wilt. Combining that wilt along with Oklahoma temperatures of 90 degrees um, will kill off our squash plants. So we've had to find ways, primarily using a mixture of diatomaceous earth and seven dust to cut down on the numbers of those uh, bugs. And then also in the summertime when it starts getting very, very hot outside, especially um, above 95 degrees, we oftentimes go out and we water the plants in the afternoon, just for 15, 20, 30 minutes, just enough to cool that plant down and take some stress off of it in the heat of the day. And by doing some of these methods, um, our, our squash has been able to build up a little bit of a resistance to the wilt. And of course, there's always gonna be other issues that we're gonna run into with gardening. Things like droughts, freezes, floods, animals, pests. Um, there's all kinds of problems that we run into in gardening, uh, but it can be a very fun venture. So now we're gonna switch gears a little bit and talk about cultural forestry or some of our native plants. So when talking about forestry, of course, what we think of when we think of a forest is trees. But as this says, these ain't no trees because a lot of the plants that grow in the forest that we as Cherokees are most dependent on are not trees, but they need that forest environment to be able to grow. For a long time, we've sort of had an issue in that most people think that this is what forestry looks like, pine planting. If you cut down a forest, you just have to replace the trees to replace the forest, right? But that's not quite true. Uh, if you do go through and you replace a eastern deciduous forest with nothing but pine, it completely changes the environment. It changes the pH of the soil. It changes uh, the way that light filters through. Um, you get a totally different type of forest. And in this forest, we're not going to get all of those culturally important plants that we were using for medicines and foods and utilitarian purposes. So now I'll talk a little bit about some of those plants. Uh, what we have pictured here is Eastern Red Cedar. Eastern Red Cedar is used for sort of cleansing purposes. Uh, this is oftentimes used to sort of bless or cleanse homes and people. We've already talked a little bit about Jola tobacco, tobacco being used for ceremonial purposes. This is one that we don't see too often here in Oklahoma. This is American ginseng. Um, ginseng is important. It was sort of considered one of the Cherokee warriors plants. Uh, we would oftentimes make a tea from this plant and it had a lot of medicinal purposes, but uh, this is oftentimes used in energy drinks today because it's kind of known to help give an energy boost. This is golden seal. So ginseng likes to get a bacteria or a, a fungus on its roots. It tends to attract fungus to its roots. Golden seal though is an antifungal so we oftentimes find both of these plants growing together because, excuse me, uh, the golden seal helps to protect the ginseng from fungus. Uh, so this is one of the plants that we wanna look for when looking for ginseng. Um, and golden seal also tends to be very high in alkaloids. This is red root or also known as prairie willow. The root of this plant is actually very, very bright red. Uh, and is a common plant used for a lot of medicines. This is New Jersey tea, which is also referred to as red root, and it also has a red root. Part of the reason why we don't like to use common names for a lot of plants because common names can overlap. Uh, New Jersey tea has a whole host of uh, purposes, but one of the ways that it pulled its name, uh, the modern name New Jersey tea, is because when the Boston Tea Party occurred, all the tea was dumped into the harbor the settlers who were here at the time were used to getting their tea 
to come over from England, uh, they weren't getting that. And so they started looking to some of the plants that the natives around them, Native American peoples uh, were using for teas. New Jersey tea is one that actually took off because it has good flavor, doesn't really have a whole lot of caffeine in it. Um, and it kind of tends to help with things like headaches and upset stomachs and has a whole host of uh, uses. This is Rattlesnake Master. Uh, Rattlesnake Master is named because one of the things that we believe is that snakes will be um, not attracted to this plant. They will go away from this plant. And it was also used to help treat snake bites. There's a button on the root of the plant that was used to treat snake bites. So the seven plants that we just saw are referred to as the seven sacred plants of the Cherokee. Kind of like with some of the other things that we have, not all families necessarily agree that this is these seven. Some think that there may have been some different plants uh, that would be swapped out with these, but you know, seven is an important and a sacred number for us. And um, so that was our seven sacred plants. Now, um, getting away from the seven sacred plants, we'll go over some more of our native plants. This is Sweet Everlasting. Sweet Everlasting is known to sort of have a butterscotch smell, although it doesn't always smell like butterscotch. Sometimes it, it has a very strong scent that isn't quite so pleasant, uh, but this is sort of high in menthol, so it helps to sort of clear congestion, can be made into a tea to help people out with colds. This is Bloodroot. Uh, Bloodroot, the most common purpose for this today is to be used as a dye. It did have medicinal uses as well, but our favorite thing to use for today is that if you get a hold of that root, you've even just touching your fingers to it, it will dye your fingers sort of a bright orange or red color. And it's really makes a great dye for basket materials or other materials. Uh, River cane is a notoriously hard material to work with when weaving baskets. It's also notoriously hard to dye. Blood root is one of the things that will dye river cane without fading out over time. May apple. Uh, technically, all parts of the may apple are considered poisonous, although uh, not in a particularly tasty plant. However, there are times of the year where that apple can be eaten. Um, again, it has many different uh, uses medicinally, but almost anywhere where this is found throughout the world, it and its counterparts, uh, it tended to be used as a cancer treatment. This is watercress. Uh, watercress is edible. It's kind of known for having a Spicy flavor can be used in salads. Watercress sandwiches are common. Uh, watercress is really found across the United States, um, but it is actually not native to the Americas, though it does predate Columbus. It's believed that this may have possibly come over uh, with the Vikings, and that was how it was introduced to the Americas. This is a very small picture, or a picture of a very small plant of high bush huckleberry. Uh, huckleberries, um, what we technically have here in Oklahoma isn't considered to be a true huckleberry. Uh, our huckleberries are in the blueberry family. However, very, very tasty. Um, many people love this uh, particular variety, especially the high bush huckleberry. Most people are pretty familiar with wild onions. Uh, of course, we like our wild onions and eggs. One thing about those green plants, some of those first green plants that come up in the springtime, like wild onions or also like a cut leaf cone flower is that that green plant coming up at the beginning of the spring we sort of believe to be a blood purifier and it's probably because after all winter long of sort of eating a lot of the same things and not having a whole lot of really really fresh uh, vegetables or fresh greens this is sort of those first uh, fresh greens and so we believe that these are going to be blood purifying uh, uh, plants uh, medicines this is echinacea, also known as purple cone flower. Um, it's sort of an immune system booster. It's still a very, very common uh, known immune system booster today. This is green dragon, sometimes known as jack in the pulpit. There's actually two different types or two different varieties of this plant here. Um, all parts of this plant are sort of considered poisonous or toxic. The fruit that you see on this plant though most of the plants that we have here that are toxic and would make you sick are not very palatable. Uh, you're probably not going to eat enough of them in most cases to really hurt you. But green dragon, this particular fruit actually tends to taste, um, be pretty tasty. So it's one that you really have to be careful with. It's sort of bright red. Usually that bright red coloring means to be careful or stay away in nature. Um, so don't be eating things that you don't know what they are. 
because this one is tasty and you could probably very easily eat enough of it uh, that it could harm you. People who have had this have claimed that when they've bitten into it and eaten it, that it feels like having, um, having razor blades or needles sliced across their tongue or sort of poked all over in their mouth and it tends to make them very, very sick. Uh, they end up spending the rest of the day very close to the restroom because it sort of purges the system. But this had many purposes medicinally. This is American basket flower. Uh, this one we kind of show as a little bit of a trick for you because American basket flower is a native plant which was traditionally used um, for the white, downy, fluffy side of darts for blowguns. However, it is not what we usually use today. Today, our favorite thing to use is thistle. Uh, this is actually a, a photo of scotch thistle. Bull thistle is another common thistle used for darts today. Um, thistle is not native to the Americas, but is the favorite thing to use for darts. But before we had this, we could use American basket flower. It just doesn't make darts quite as well as the thistle does, and it's a little bit harder to find than true thistle is. So the plant in the center of this slide is um, jewelweed. Jewelweed's Cherokee name, if we read it at the bottom, is Uludi Nuwot. Uh, Nuwot is our word for medicine. But if you look at the top of the slide and at the bottom of the slide, you'll see two separate plants that are also referred to as Uludi. Uludi actually refers to the fact that it's a vine or that it climbs upon or it grows upon. The plant, um, the picture that we have at the top right is actually a picture of Virginia creeper. In most cases, Virginia creeper is pretty uh, harmless for most people. The picture at the bottom left is a picture of poison ivy. Uh, of course, poison ivy, we tend to have the allergic itchy reaction to. It's the urushal oil that uh, it occurs in poison ivy that causes that allergic reaction. Many people tend to confuse poison ivy and Virginia creeper because it is not uncommon to find both of these plants growing in the same area. Uh, they will oftentimes grow on the same tree. They're both vines, so you come into contact with poison ivy, see Virginia creeper, and start to assume that it's the same thing. With poison ivy, we want to look for those leaves of three, let it be. Now, jewelweed is actually known to have a chemical in it that binds to the urushal and poison ivy and helps to render it inactive. So if you know you've come into contact with poison ivy and you can find some jewelweed, just about all parts of a jewelweed plant can be crushed and applied anywhere, sort of rubbed over anywhere where you've come into contact with that poison ivy and you shouldn't break out with the itchy rash. This is sassafras. Uh, sassafras is known, this is another one where we refer to leaves of three, but for a different reason. Sassafras is one of the few trees that has three distinct leaves. So on most trees, most of the leaves are going to look pretty uniform. They're all pretty similar. But sassafras has very three uh, very distinct different types of leaves on it. One of those is referred to as the soft, the football. It's sort of just a single lobed leaf kind of in an oval shape. The second one is a double lobed leaf, which sort of looks similar to a mitten. And the third is the three lobed leaf, which some people refer to as the turkey track or uh, the ghost. Uh, this is a picture of Ozark chinkapin. Chinkapins are closely related to American chestnuts. Uh, chestnut trees, of course, have a nice um, edible nut on them that's known to be very tasty. We really didn't have a lot of chestnut, though, in this part of the country here in Oklahoma. What we did have was chinkapins, which also have a nut that's pretty close, uh, very similar to a chestnut, and they're also very tasty. But when the American chestnut blight moved through, which killed off a big portion of the American chestnuts here in the United States, that blight also affects our chinkapin trees. Um, and so they have also, many of our chinkapin trees have been killed off. They can still be found today, but they're much harder to find. So we don't get to uh, enjoy the chinkapin nut as often um, as we would have been able to enjoy these, you know, a hundred years ago. Uh, but at one time it was a very important food source for both native peoples and for the wildlife. This is common mullen. Mullen is another plant that is not native to the United States, but we have found a whole host of uh, uses for. It's an exotic invasive, uh, but there it can be used as an arthritis treatment. It's used for teething babies, and some people almost use it similarly to tobacco. Now we'll kind of talk a little bit about some of the uh, mushrooms and 
a shift away from the plants. This is a picture of Wishy. Uh, most Cherokees really love Wishy. It's very, very edible um, uh, mushroom. Uh, it doesn't quite have that mushroomy texture. So most people who don't even like mushrooms uh, tend to like Wishy. Common morels. Uh, morels can be kind of tough to find, but in the springtime they start coming up. And so this will be something that everybody will be looking for pretty soon. And this is a picture of uh, in Cherokee, we call this uguku, which is one of our words for owl. Uh, this tends to be called owl's head or lion's mane mushroom. A little bit of a different texture, but not a particularly strong flavor. It's a, another common uh, favorite mushroom. So all of the plants that we just talked about are examples of non-wood or mostly non-wood forest products. Cherokees are considered a people of the eastern deciduous forest, but trees are not the only thing that we find in those forests and they're a very small component of our plant universe. However, the eastern deciduous forest, that environment is so important to be able to find all of these plants and it goes to show why it's so important for us to preserve these natural forest areas because if we're not preserving it, we can't find all of these plants and without these plants, uh, we really lose an important um, source of who we are. So the Cherokee River Cane Project, uh, after getting the Cherokee Nation Heirloom gar Garden um, started, one of the things that was decided was that we wanted to be able to uh, start growing some native plants out there on site. And one of the first things that we started with was River Cane. This is Pat Gwynn and Mark Dunham prepping the site. They had to go out, uh, get some rootstock that they could then take back, plant into the site. And it was not an easy job. Uh, for a couple of years, river cane can be so easy to cut down that you can't even get near it with a, um, a weed eater. And so that's actually Mark Dunham out there cutting out the Bermuda grass from around the river cane using hand scissors. Um, one of the things that river cane does is when you first get it planted in, especially as a rootstock, it usually stresses it. And so it will flower and seed and flowering, seeing river cane flowers a pretty rare occurrence, but it flowers, it seeds, drops that seed, then most of the time, once river cane flowers and drops viable seed, the plant will die, but it grows back from that seed. Take a, a while for the river cane to really start going well. This is in 2013. At that point, we could still see over the river cane. Um, however, today it's you know at 20 feet tall in some places, although we always kind of have some issues with all of our plants. So one of the things that we actually started growing out in the Cherokee Nation uh, heirloom site is red root. I talked about prairie willow or red root earlier as one of those uh, seven sacred plants. Our elders had actually asked us to grow a red root on site. And so we got one out there that was doing really, really well. And then they pointed out to us that red root tends to grow both as a male and a female and that they're used for differently for medicinal purposes, the male and the female. And so they wanted us to have both male and female represented. However, that was actually a very hard thing to find. It took uh, some research to find out what the phenotypical differences were between a male plant and a female plant red root. And then when we went out to actually try to find plants, uh, what we discovered was that males tend to grow like the plant on the left, almost kind of a red fuzzy looking flower to it. Females tend to grow like the one on the right. They kind of have, tend to be a, a green spiky looking flower. Um, and that's really the only time that you can tell the male and the female apart is when they're flowering, which is pretty early in the year for just a couple of weeks. By going from this information, we knew that the plant that we had growing on site was a male, uh, but we had a very, very tough time finding a female because almost all the sites that we went to had plants that looked like males. They had a few plants that maybe looked like females and then plants that didn't quite follow the, the diagram or didn't quite follow the book and looked like something in between the two. So we actually had brought back two different plants to our site. One of them was a plant that looked kind of in between the two. One of them was a plant that looked more like what the, the literature says a female is supposed to look like. And all we can say is that every year when all three of our plants flower, our original male still, still flowers as a by the book male. The one that we brought back that we were pretty sure was female still tends to flower as a female. The one that was in between has always kind of been in between. Um, it always flowers with uh, a 
some characteristics of a little bit of both. So between all of these, we think we have our bases covered. One of the other issues that we've had is with river cane. So as I mentioned, in most cases when river cane flowers and seeds, it drops viable seed and then it dies off. However, our river cane a few years ago started flowering and we had no idea why. Usually river cane doesn't flower very often. It tends to have a lifespan of 100 years or longer. Um, ours obviously was not that old. We went back to the original root stock uh, where, where the from the site where we had originally taken the river cane because the book says if your root stock uh, transplantings are flowering then maybe the original stock was also flowering. That was not the case. Um, the first time it flowered and seeded it didn't die. Uh, it took a few years before the river cane started dying off and we've still never quite found out what's causing the stress but we've gone in and we've thinned out our cane and that seems to be helping and kind of slowing down the process it might have just been that the cane needed some more light down in the middle of it because it grows very, very thickly. So just like with anything in gardening, things don't always quite work out and act just like they're supposed to. Uh, tips for starting seeds. It really kind of depends on the seed that we're talking about. So um, generally, whenever we're working with our heirloom crops, you, you know, we'll, we'll send out the, the seed guide, but uh, really the main thing is making sure like with the corn, the beans, the squash, now the pumpkins, uh, that you don't start those too early in the year. You know, really a couple of decades ago, um, you could have set your calendars, you could have set your watches by the fact that most seeds needed to be planted at the end of April, the beginning of May. I will say this year we didn't get our corn in the ground until mid-June. Uh, so it seems like sometimes in certain years, things just come a little bit later, but it's really important that we wait until it's warm enough for uh, that the soils are warm enough to be able to support this, um, letting those seeds germinate. So we really say you need about a four inch soil depth of 60 degrees or more for it to be warm enough. Um, we can start, we oftentimes do start the gourds, the pumpkins and the squash inside and in peat pots. Uh, we've been known to start some of those in the greenhouse or even just kind of starting them inside in the office setting or, or whatever, and then moving them outside once they get to be about six inches tall. The problem that we have with anything that we try to start indoors before moving outside is that oftentimes when it gets moved outside, especially in the springtime when we're having a lot of those storms come through, is that the stems aren't strong enough to be able to handle the uh, winds that come through. And so we, the, the kind of the best thing that you can do for any plant that started inside is make sure that every once in a while it's getting a little bit of a breeze. Put it in a room where there's a fan on so it's kind of being exposed to a little bit of a breeze and that will help to strengthen up those stems. For starting tobacco, we actually suggest starting tobacco in uh, small indoor peat pots. You can, you know, oftentimes go to garden stores and find what they call the small indoor greenhouse, which Really all it is, is it's small green pots and a, a tray and it has a clear um, lid that goes over the entire tray. And the, uh, those are probably the easiest way for starting most of the native seed plants as well. Just take and put a couple of uh, seeds in each of those small peat pots. For the tobacco especially, just sort of mist the tops of those peat pots. You don't wanna water really heavily. Most of the time tobacco will have almost a 100% germination rate. So within about three days, all of the seeds will germinate. The issue with tobacco is that it tends to be so sensitive that it can get um, killed very easily. Any sort of a, a little bit of a vibration that when it's first germinating, everything is so small that the roots hairs um, are also so small that it's really easy to break those and to kill those really small germinated plants. So it's really for the first, those first couple of weeks, you have to be pretty careful with it. And so if you notice that it does need to be watered, just really go in and just kind of mist it. Um, and then once they have started to grow, once they're above the, the top of the soil, then again, you definitely want to get those exposed to some wind breeze or basically get them into a room with a little bit of a fan uh, and keep watering them, just keep misting them because um, they're pretty sensitive up until they get about probably about five inches, six inches tall before they're strong enough to be able to handle a whole lot of jostling. For everything, once it gets to be about six inches tall, 
uh, they generally are going to do better when they're moved outside and put in the ground. There are a few things that can go ahead and be continue to be kept in the pot, but that's really what we uh, suggest for starting out any of the native plants. It's kind of starting out with one of those peat pots where you can really watch the temperatures, uh, watch the moisture, and just keep in mind that for a lot of the native plants, you know, we offer the things like the jewel weed, um, the echinacea and stuff like that, but they tend to be a little bit harder to get to germinate, which is why it's a little bit easier to put them into a peat pot where they have really, really great soil and where you can really control the moisture and make sure that they're not going to get hit by a uh, light frost or something of that sort. Uh, thank you. I'm glad you enjoyed the presentation. Soil amendments for corn. Uh, one thing, of course, that we're all sort of aware of is that corn really likes a lot of nitrogen. That was part of the reason why originally when the three sisters were done, uh, corn and beans were planted together because uh, uh, the beans are actually known as a nitrogen fixer in the soil. Uh, so you just, and really and truly, it's, it's not even the, so much that you need to add a lot of nitrogen. A, a lot of organic materials usually in your soil throughout the winter time is enough to, to do well for corn. Whenever we are working on our soils, because we're uh, on our site with a site where we grow probably 80% of the um, heirloom crops, that is such a heavily used site and the soils are also heavily used. So we really spend almost our entire winter uh, prepping the soils. And the main thing that we do, which I know some people don't really like to do too much, is we'd actually do a lot of tilling. And it's to make sure that we're getting as much of that organic material back into the soil and kind of getting it broke up. And we'll add any sort of mater uh, organic material that we can get a hold of. So that can be um, dried leaves, you know, uh, sometimes dried grass, uh, whatever we can get a hold of, and we till that back into the soil. And then we oftentimes do go through, which of course this would be adding the the fertilizer um, is that we actually add either cow manure or um, we've had sheep, goats before. So we try to find something, some sort of organic uh, fertilizer that we can add back into that soil. And of course, if you don't have access to that, then you would wanna get something that possibly had some um, uh, nitrogen or something in it as well. Will any of our seeds make it to the Global Seed Vault in Norway? And are there any Cherokee heirloom tomato varieties? So our seeds did make it to the Global Seed Vault in Norway. Uh, we had, I believe that was in 2019, that we finally got um, our seeds into the Seed Vault in Norway. Uh, it was really exciting because, you know, that, that was really what I had said, got the um, conversation, got the ball rolling on the seed bank. And then they turned around and they reached out to us. They reached out to Pat Gwynn um, about possibly getting our seeds over there. So it was about a full year. We had to really make sure that we were gonna have enough seeds to take over there. But our four varieties of corn, our four varieties of beans and the Georgia candy roaster squash are all in the seed vault in Norway. And of course you can do a Google search on that or you can also email me at seedbank at cherokee.org all kinds of um, uh, newspaper articles and a lot of, of PR that was done on that because it was really exciting for all of us. Now, as far as the Cherokee heirloom tomato varieties, there technically are none that we consider to be true Cherokee. Uh, so the story behind the Cherokee purple tomato was that it was grown by a family um, that it was cultivated by a family in Tennessee. And when they were, it came time to name the tomato, it was purple. So that of course is why it got the purple name, uh, but they took it and some people are um, confused as to whether they chose the name Cherokee because they were Cherokee or whether they chose the name Cherokee because of the lands that they were on originally being Cherokee and kind of being in a Cherokee County area. So that was how the Cherokee purple tomato took its name. Um, and even if it was a Cherokee family, which of course is not something that we can even prove, uh, the problem is, is that it wasn't actually something that was cultivated by the tribe. We did not have tomatoes this far north in North America prior to European contact. Uh, tomatoes are native to you know, South America and parts of the Central America, kind of down further in Mexico, uh, but we didn't actually have them this far north. So it's just not something that's tribe ever cultivated, which is why we have no Cherokee tomato varieties.
yeah, the, the cone flowers, it, they can be kind of tough to um, get to germinate and but that the, they will germinate. Uh, we have managed to grow a lot of ours. And when we specifically started our echinacea and our purple cone flower, again, we used one of those peat pot trays. It was just a lot easier. And, uh, you know, we would take them, like I said, each peat pot, a few seeds, sprinkle it with some water, make sure it gets some moisture in there and put the plastic on the top of it. And then, you know, you can set it near, really and truly until the plant is growing, they don't even need a whole lot of light exposure, but we'll oftentimes set them near a window. Once the plant has started growing, then you wanna keep it close. You wanna make sure it has some light and really keep an eye on that moisture. But that clear top really helps with the moisture. It's when you take the top off and start exposing it to the fan uh, where you really have to go through and make sure that you're misting on a regular basis. I have heard, now we did not soak our coneflower seeds first, um, but I've heard of great things. A lot of people like to actually let their, any of their native seeds soak for a little while before they do. Uh, the thing with most native seeds is they need to go through some stratifications. They need to go through some cold stratification and do lots of things, which anything that comes from the seed bank goes through a cold stratification because we store everything in the freezer prior to packaging it up and uh, sending it out. And it's usually stored for a minimum of about uh, eight weeks. So um, that'll definitely make sure that they get their full cold stratification in. But a lot of people do like to soak them and that they, they do have some great success by doing that. So it is a great thing to try. And usually we try to make sure that we send you enough seeds that you might even be able to experiment, you know, take half of them and try uh, one method and take the other half and try another method because it's really kind of sometimes, you know, it's a um, just a matter of experimenting and failing and trying again. Do you or would you consider housing bees? Uh, we have actually had people approach us before on bee houses. We have um, had the discussion. We have considered it. We have never ruled it out. Uh, I think in the cases before when the conversations have happened and we've gotten ready to do it, it just for whatever reasons, a lot of those things have fallen through. Uh, of course, that kind of goes above me. That would be a conversation for Pat Gwynn, the Secretary of Natural Resources, and then probably also administration because of where the garden site sits. Um, and it tends to be used a lot for uh, public tours and things, and it's not too far from the Cherokee Nation complex. It's something that everybody kind of has to sign off on, uh, but it uh, is something that we have looked into. We have never been against it. Uh, we keep the pollinator houses in the garden, and we really like to have a lot of pollinators there. Um, so, you know, if somebody is interested in talking to us about bees, then you can always approach us, and we'd love to have that conversation. I think I'm all caught up on the um, questions I received through the chat. Are there any other questions that anybody has? Uh, and I do will say we're hoping, um, we have been working on a booklet for the last couple of years, which is really kind of a plant guide. So every year we have the small brochure that we send out with the seeds that has really, really basic instructions, mostly for heirloom crops. Uh, this year we're actually looking, hopefully it will be available this next year in 2022. We may still be, um, it, it may not be available until after we do our mail out, but it will probably be about eight pages long and we'll have very specific instructions for each heirloom crop. Now, again, the native seeds that we distribute are so, uh, excuse me, so numerous that we may not be able to actually include instructions on each of those varieties. But for the most part, the instructions for native tobacco would still be pretty similar to what we, uh, we would suggest for native plants. Um, almost everything is really gonna like to be outside more than, uh, you know, the, no, most of these things aren't gonna grow well inside or in uh, containers, but occasionally there are a few of the native plants that will grow well in containers. And sometimes the best thing there too is you know, we, we specifically grow everything on site and we're really used to the way that we do things, but sometimes you can look up some of the varieties and see things that people have done on the internet. For example, the um, Jerusalem artichoke, the sunchoke, that because it tends to be a very weedy plant. So whenever you plant the tubers, this is one of those plants, those flowers are just known for spreading out and really taking an area over 
And so the first year they come up and everybody's excited, but three years into it, they start getting frustrated because they really start to spread out and they take everything over. And so I had actually uh, read an article about a woman who trying to avoid that had planted the sunchokes in a very, very large container. We're talking probably five gallons or more. I would say definitely 10 gallons would be better. Um, and, and possibly, you know, if, if you can get something larger than that would still be better. But she had planted the sunchokes in, in a very large container, really had to keep up with the watering on them, but said that come that winter, whenever she was ready, it was just a matter of dumping the dirt out. She was able to get a hold of the tubers, replanted a few of the tubers, and then had very, very easy access to the ones that she wanted to um, use for food. So sometimes some of those native plants will do well in containers. They just tend to need larger containers than uh, normal. They don't make great house plants. Right, any other questions? I think we still got just a few minutes left. Thank you. I'm glad that you enjoyed the presentation. What well, don't? All right. Well, I think that that is it. Uh, if anybody does have any other questions, if you would like to talk to me, again, you can always email us at seedbank at Cherokee.org, or you can call the office at 918-453-5336. Uh, we do hope to have the seed bank again. Oh, well, we will have the seed bank available again uh, in 2022. Generally, we start accepting uh, seed requests on February 1st. We're not sure this year the website could potentially change We've had some issues in the past with so many orders coming in uh, the last couple of years that we might make some changes to the website. Um, I may, may even change the website altogether, um, trying to find something that's gonna work a little bit better. So that way we're, we're not getting quite so overran with the request where we're not able to keep up. Uh, but again, you know, be looking for that. If you have any questions and are wanting to get a hold of those seeds, you can contact me now, but generally the best time is to contact us in January. By January, we'll usually have all of our, um, everything sort of worked out. We'll know the list of seeds that we're going to have available for the year. Uh, we'll be able to get that information to you, get the website information to you. So come January, I can usually answer all the questions where this early in the year, uh, we're still, we haven't really even started harvesting it. So we're not quite sure everything that we will have. The list does vary from year to year. So we do not always have the exact same seeds available year after year. We may have some new things we're hoping this year, uh, but there's also some things that I think people are gonna be really used to having available that we're just not gonna have available this year. Uh, so it can really vary every year. Tips on storing seeds. Um, the best thing for storing seeds, and it kind of depends. So. Freezing them is really good, especially in an area like Oklahoma, where we have so many changes in temperature and humidity. Um, freezing works great, but even the freezer that we use for the seed bank purposes is, you know, one of those really expensive ones that's supposed to control all of the moisture and everything inside of it. The main thing about seeds is that you really want to make sure that they're in a very constant environment that they don't experience a lot of fluctuations in either temperature or moisture. So if you're going to freeze them, I would probably take and put them in a couple of airtight containers and then stick them in the freezer and they can actually keep that way for a couple of years. Uh, if you want to store them outside of the freight freezer, again, put them in a couple of airtight containers, stick them into a cupboard where there's probably very little light and they're not going to get a lot of changes in uh, moisture and temperature. You, you just kind of want everything to remain really constant. And usually in that way, they can keep for a couple of years. Remember that the seeds that we have sent to you have already gone through a frozen process and an unfrozen process. And generally, the seeds that we're sending to you aren't going to keep for very long. Uh, you know, you may be able to store them for another year and get good germination. Um, but that's not always the case just because we've already had to manipulate them so much. Um, but for the seeds that you are getting off of your own plants, you definitely want to make sure that they get completely dried out first and then store them in those constant conditions. All right. Any other questions? 
think we just have a couple more minutes, about five minutes left if anybody has any last questions before we get off here. Okay. Well, well, don't everybody, uh, I hope you enjoyed it. Again, feel free to contact us for any questions. Hopefully I've answered everything. Um, but if you have further questions or you need any tips or tricks and definitely get with me in January and we'll, we'll help you out with the seed bank. Um, and if for whatever reason, oftentimes when people call, you know, especially this time of year, I'm out of the office a lot, leave a voicemail. I may not always be able to get back to it same day, but I will always return your voicemail. So call the office, leave a voicemail. We'll definitely get back to you. And we can generally get back to emails a little bit faster. Um, but yeah, this is a, a busy time of year. We tend to spend a lot of time outside this time of year. Okay. Well, well, don't everyone have a great day. I hope you enjoyed it.